Making Buffalo Home, which brings you flavors from home, is funded by Rich Products Corporation and the Rich Family Foundation. Cultures from around the world use food to connect with family and community. In Buffalo, our rich history of immigration brought recipes and traditions that we still hold dear today. Easter and Christmas wouldn't be Easter and Christmas without sausage bacon. Our recent immigrants from around the world are making Buffalo home and bringing their food traditions with them. Bulgogi on my food truck and when they have it, their eyes light up and like, oh yeah, I want that. This is Flavors from Home. My food truck has Lebanese food, Korean food, and Italian food, and Polish food because of my father. In honor of my father, we make homemade pierogi. So we're gonna do chapche, Lebanese chicken wrap, and a bulgogi. When I was little, Julia Child, I would watch her on PBS, and I just loved that, and it never went away. My husband's Lebanese, I'm Korean, my daughter's part Italian, my mother is Irish and French, and my father is Polish and German. I was in an orphanage in Korea, St. Paul's Orphanage. When I was adopted, I was 10 years old. At the orphanage, they did have a cook, and I loved being with her, always by her side, watching her cook and I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's my first memory of cooking. Today, I made bulgogi, which is beef that is cut thinly and marinated with kimchi fried rice that I have fermented myself with sauté vegetables. The dish itself is a mix of everything that I love about uh, my Korean food. The rice, the kimchi, the flavor, you know, the marinade, the freshness. Myself, personally, love bold flavors, and that's what Korean food has, because we use a lot of ginger, garlic, all kinds of vegetables. That's what I love about it. Buffalo, we have our food trucks that go to local businesses, festivals. Do I have everything? Bulgogi, daiji bulgogi, bibimbap, chapche, Korean, savory pancake with shrimp. Everybody knows Food Truck Tuesdays at Larkin. They love my food truck because my food truck is so diverse. Is this your first time having my bulgogi? Yes. Oh my god! Thank you. There is an Asian international festival at Canal Side. There's my pork belly! And I'm the only Korean food truck, you know, which is so cool. Our foods, each one of us, is so diverse. Don't make it Judy spicy, just regular spicy. American people love beef. When they try my bulgogi on my food truck and when they have it, their eyes light up and like, oh yeah, I want that. I love when young and old try my food that they've never had before and they love it. And that makes me so happy, um, spreading my culture to them. And you know, it's great to have people come back after they eat the food to the truck and say, oh my God, that was so good. And it just makes me so happy. I never imagined owning a restaurant. My name is Diana Molinares, and my husband's name is Edgar Pachon, and we are both from Colombia. I was there until I was 16. My aunt moved here over 40 years ago, and after she moved here, she decides to bring all her family over. Edgar, ¿me puedes hacer a favor de llenar el arroz? Okay, honey. My husband was born in Colombia, and he moved to Venezuela. 
He came here because his life was in danger. He was kidnapped um, two times, so he need to leave Venezuela before something happened to him. Wonderful, it's so good. Edgar is a really sweet and hardworking guy. Honey, please, give me the rice. Thank you. He wanted to start his American dream, and that's how we met. When I first started talking to Edgar about owning a restaurant, he told I was crazy because he owned one before, and it was a lot of work. It is the only one right now in Buffalo, like Colombian food. The closest one is Mexican food or Puerto Rican food but we don't have like nothing authentic like Colombia. Today, we make carne guisada, arroz de fideos, and tajadas. Carne guisada is just uh, meat with vegetables, and just throw it in a pan with salt, cumin, cover it, and let it cook for half an hour, 45 minutes. The vegetables and the juices from the meat, they're gonna make the gravy. Arroz de fideos, that is angel herbs, rice, and garlic. In Colombia, everybody eats rice. In lunch, dinner, we eat rice every single day. We mix with other things to not make it boring and eat the same thing every day. So we just start getting creative. <laughs> Tajadas, you eat them every day. Fried plantains are like bananas, but they sweeter than the banana. So you just peel it, cut it, and put it in the fryer. It's important for me to share my culture because I want people to know Latin culture. We all speak Spanish. We eat similar things, but we are not the same. Mexicans eat spicy food. We don't eat spicy food. We try to season the food with the vegetables. I feel happy because I know that I'm showing people our culture of food. My family is proud of us. My family is like looking after us and say, I know you can do it. It's like a dream come true. I think this is why it's important to immigrants to come here that we have this opportunity to work and have a better future for us. I consider myself Colombian. When it comes to food, I will eat Colombian food. When it comes to music, I will listen to Colombian music. I will go and visit, and I love it. But after like a week, okay, I need to go back home. <laughs> what I consider home is Buffalo. It's my home. I am Mary Maricoya. My mom and I will be making jollof rice. Jollof rice, I'm sorry. I just like the way you make it. When I make it, it's just so different. So get to someone's heart, prepare jollof rice. Jollof rice is similar to jambalaya. I remember growing up in Nigeria, it's the only food we eat on occasions. It's not something we eat every day. You eat it on weddings. So when you hear birthday party, you're so happy that you're gonna eat jollof rice. It's a special meal. It's a very, I remember growing up, to me it's like the only special meal. The only day you get to eat jollof rice is maybe on Christmas. In the jollof rice, there is, um, there is the abanero pepper, which is really spicy. Red pepper, tomato, garlic, onions, and maggi, thyme, and butter, curry, garlic, ginger. We're gonna get the meat cooking. You wanna boil it, you save the meat broth, pour it inside the soup. Also, cook the pepper. You wanna boil it. Then pour the, um, the tomato paste, the tomato puree, and have it cooked all together. At that point, you really know you're making jollof, right? Because you begin to smell the tomatoes, the 
meat broth, the spices. <laughs> no, yeah, it's like, like it's actually, it actually tastes good. Like it tastes like the real deal. <laughs> That's where the magic happens. You also want to wash the rice. We usually put salt to wash our rice because it helps wash the starch. Our then you want to put the rice in the um, warm pot. While the rice is cooking, you want to lower the, the stove, cover it to let it like steam. My name is Rizzi Katz. I'm coming from Nigeria. I miss my people. But in Buffalo, the people in living in Buffalo, they have love. I was going to leave like after college, but since I've been here, I'm like this way. It's like, it's nice. My mom goes to school, she works, and she also sews on the side, and she loves it. Like, that's another part. When I see her sew, I'm like, this woman, like, anyway, she loves sewing, so she does it all. My mom would never give you food without meat on it. You do not give people food without any type of meat. Very disrespectful. All right. Like, very, very disrespectful. My mom's jello fries, to be honest, I never taste anything like that. She may not necessarily have all the ingredients she would use in Nigeria, but she still finds a way to find every piece that she could get here. <laughs> like I still, when I eat it, I still feel that warmth, like, you know, that, that mother kind of touch, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's just filled with love. My name is Michael Nguyen. My Vietnamese name is Vũ Nguyen. I moved from South Vietnam to America when I was 15 in 1991 and settled in Buffalo, New York. I love cooking. I think food is very important. It is memory. Every time I cook Vietnamese food or eat egg roll, shrimp, mango salad, pho, it brings me back when I was 15. Vietnamese egg roll has a lot more ingredients when you prepare. Uh, Chinese egg roll only like two, three ingredients only and it's very fast to, uh, to make it and roll it. Vietnamese egg roll, it might take up to an hour at least to prepare, an hour to three hours to prepare. I always Make it double layer instead of making one. So double layer will make your roll stronger, be crispier when you bite. I think my mom's cooking is the best. I learned most of my recipe from her. Every time I cook, I test her cooking in my cooking too. Another dish that I made today was shrimp mango salad. The mango salad is like a tropical fruit salad because we use fresh mango, pickle, um, daikon, and carrots. Very popular in Vietnam. When you go to uh, a Vietnamese restaurant, you almost always can see a mango salad on their menu. Myself, I love playing with colors. When I cook, I always try to combine as many colors as possible. You know, instead of putting um, red and red together, I will make sure there's yellow, green, and then I mix them up or place them to the right place, right spot to make the color stand out. The main dish that we are making tonight will be pho. Pho is beef noodle soup. It consists of the broth, the beef broth, uh, meat, and rice noodle. It is a Vietnamese traditional uh, noodle soup. It is very popular in Vietnam as street food. Usually they, they're having pho as breakfast, but you can have it lunch or dinner, and you can have it every day. I might have uh, 10,000 bowl of pho, but it never, it never gets old. I love pho, I can eat it every day. I can sip until the last drop of the broth. That's how I like it. Vietnamese cuisine 
is extremely di diverse. It features a combination of five fundamental tests, uh, which are spicy, sour, sweet, bitter, and salty. When you know how to balance those five rules elements, and uh, you combine with additional three, three more, which are the fragrance, when it smells good, taste, when it tastes delicious, and the color, those three combined together, it will make your dish up to another level. Experience I learned was from my mom. I learned a little bit of every, you know, from her every day, and eventually come up with a strong background in cooking. My grandfather, he moved to America from Vietnam after the falls of Saigon, 1975, after the war. He settled in Buffalo, New York. My family sponsored by him and we moved here and we stay here since then, almost 30 years. We built our life here and we start loving it. We love Buffalo. It is our second home that bring us a lot of opportunity, give us uh, many chances. We would like to say thank you. Thank you very much. We live in a predominantly Irish neighborhood. So when we moved in and put up our American flag and below the American flag was the Polish flag, heads started to turn. <laughs> And uh, then we made sausage. The one Polish person in the neighborhood didn't like kielbasa. <laughs> but our Irish neighbor on this side loves it. There's another lady down the street, a nice man across the street who loves our sausage. So at the end, you know, I'll take a link to them for Christmas time. They know when we're coming because they can smell it. The Easter and Christmas wouldn't be Easter and Christmas without sausage making and the blessed baskets with the sausage in it and the eggs and the butter and everything else. The recipe is my grandpa Brisky's recipe. Um, his name was Henry, his mother and father were Polish immigrants. My children will be fourth generation sausage makers. This will be your job from here on out, okay? As they get older, they understand it a little more. They get excited to do it. And if I don't show them, nobody will. Here comes the meat. We got the meat. This is things they'll remember. This gives them um, a good foundation, a good heart. So I've taken these casings and I rinse them and soak them. We cut these uh, about 13 inches long. My grandfather's links were around 32 inches because his hung over the broom handle. I'm going to measure my salt and pepper in this and then pour it into this bowl. And then from this bowl, it'll all go into the sausage periodically. And this meat is fresh from the butcher shop today. It's a great mix of fat and meat. You need that. You don't want too much fat and you don't want too much meat. and mix and mix so you don't have any pockets of pepper or salt or anything like that. And then from there it goes into the stuffer. Okay, the stuffer's full. It's five pounds. So we're going to put the casing on. Now I apply slight pressure to the casing on the horn and I pull it as Charlie cranks it. Just a steady crank. You don't have to go too fast. No. Nope. Not on the five pound. Okay. Then you back it off at the end. We twist it. And there's our first link. The way we smoke is the traditional way to smoke. Well, we got some apple wood chips in the smoking process. You can't have wood that's too dry. The wetness is what's going to make the smoke.
temperature we want? 250? No, Two? we'll keep it about 180, an hour and a half, and then put it at 200, 210. That'll cook it. You want it smoked first and cooked second. <laughs> he should do the talking, because I don't, you know. There you go, show it. Show it off. Hey. Let's do it. You want to do the honors? Now you'll see some of the neighbors will come over here. And when they come over, obviously you have to be gracious and say, you want a piece? And they go, yeah. And the next thing you know, you only got one link left for yourself. How many times has that happened, Charlie? Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, check the sausage. Uh, the firmness of the sausage will tell you if it's done or not. Sometimes it looks done, but the inside isn't done. It's very firm. It's taut, it'll bounce back. It's not squishy. If you can see the difference here. Like this one, I'm gonna let go because it's still squishy. It looks like it's done, but you can still kind of see through the casing. That's that. We're gonna close it up and let it cook. Let that temperature rock it up a little bit. Smoking it gives me a copious amount of anxiety because it, 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 it. It's just so much with the heat and keeping the temperature up and not over smoking it. Um, so I would say the day I dread the most is smoking day and the day I most enjoy is Easter. They're going to mass this morning. They went to get the baskets blessed. Where's your horseradish? Too kind. Okay, I'm getting the shot glasses. Yeah. So fashion. Oh, make your bassa too? Mm-hmm on Easter morning, after you go to church. You come home and you have, first of all, you ate the blessed stuff, and then you, uh, you know, it's manja after that. <laughs> Easter morning, we're done with church and we can come home and we put on the radio and we can just sit and the kids are happy and we're at the table and, you know, the butter lamb is beheaded and the Eggs are cracking and we're eating and, you know, the sausage is ready, it smells, it's just, that's when you can sit back and go, ah. It's up to each generation to do their own thing. Not only the culinary culture, but the religious culture too, and I'm very proud of that. What they're passing on to their kids is invaluable, you know, especially this one, six-year-old. Right, buddy? Every 12-year-older in America probably knows what a biscotti is. They're cookies. <laughs> you know, cookies have always been popular. There was the novelty aspect of it. It wasn't known. It wasn't, you know, cookies didn't come long. Slivers like that studded with nuts. Hi, I'm Mike DiCamillo from uh, DiCamillo family. My grandparents basically started with their uh, 11 kids. It was in 1920, and my grandfather ran the bakery and the boys, the four boys he had, and my grandmother and her seven daughters ran the store. Originally, all we did was bread, biscotti, and pizza and rolls. My brother Tom would be in charge of all production, really, and so getting it made is his part of the production. This is the start of the process. In the bowl, we have the flour, the sugar, the salt, the baking powder, and the nuts. And we're mixing it dry without any liquid because we want to get the dispersal of all those ingredients even throughout the mix. And also we want to break up any lumps of flour or sugar. Then we're going to add the liquid. And the liquid is the eggs, the vanilla, and the water. And that'll hydrate the mix and we'll be able to take it over and mix it. This is the eggs, whole eggs. Mix them up a little bit so that we're sure we get a uh, nice mix here. And then we're gonna add the water and the vanilla to this bucket to clean it out and they all end up in there.
Now that we've got the dough mixed, we're going to send it to the dough depositor and we're going to extrude it out onto pans and put it in the oven. This uh, machine was made in Italy, ideal for biscotti. This is the way it was traditionally done. And this is the way you could do it at home. This is a great cookie to make with children because it's very easy to roll along. It doesn't take any great amount of skill. So dust your table liberally. We're gonna take a hunk of dough. Form a basic log. We just roll it out. Have your pans ready. And you just put the log on the pan. We also hear the other thing. My mother didn't make them like this. The ones with the nuts that we do, primarily a northern Italian production or product. Uh, the southern Italian ones were usually softer and uh, they used to do uh, out of a mix that they call pane de spagna, which is a Spanish bread, but it, they're usually like almost a sponge cake. We got our dough in the oven and it's ready to come out. It's the first bake of the two bake cycle. Remember biscotti twice baked. This is our biscotti slicer and is specifically built for biscotti slicing. We put them on the conveyor in the back. There's a series of blades in there. They're gonna cut them and they'll fall out of the pan. Every grandmother sliced it by hand. But at home, this is perfectly acceptable and you can vary the width. If you're cutting them by hand, I could do a real thick one or I could do a real thin one. So this gives you the advantage of variation. Always want to use a serrated knife on a good flat surface. Because if your surface, cutting surface is uneven, you'll break them. So a good flat surface, a good serrated knife, and just go to it. All right, we have the biscotti all sliced, and now we're gonna put them in for the second bake. So they're crispy now, but not crisp enough. So we're gonna put them in for the second bake, and this will give you a crisp cookie that'll be perfect for dunking in your espresso or your wine, which is the traditional way of eating this type. Now our second bake is finished and the cookies are ready to come out. They're nice and crisp, and we can package them up. And some of these, we'll even put some chocolate over them. Why they're passed on, I, you know, it's, it's nostalgia. Um, you're always trying to, you know, recreate something your mother made. My grandfather's line was, when he bought the bakery, he said, I, I want to make sure everybody has something to eat. And he did it. I just hope to be a part of this community for another hundred years. To explore the entire Making Buffalo Home project, visit WNED.org slash Making Buffalo Home. Making Buffalo Home, which brings you flavors from home, is funded by Rich Products Corporation and the Rich Family Foundation.